In my long lifetime I have seen many grand and inspiring things. But, never anything that impressed me half as much as the sight of the whispering rocks as they looked on the day King Zhang was crowned. As, Bumpo, Chi Chi, Polynesia, Jip and I finally reached the dizzy edge of the great bowl and looked down inside it. It was like gazing over a never-ending ocean of copper-colored faces. For every seat in the theater was filled, every man, woman and child in the island, including Long. Arrow who had been carried up on his sick bed was there to see the show. Yet not a sound, not a pin drop, disturbed the solemn silence of the whispering rocks. It was quite creepy and sent chills running up and down your spine. Bumpo told me afterwards that it took his breath away too much for him to speak, but that he hadn't known before that there were that many people in the world. Away down by the table of the throne stood a brand new, brightly colored totem pole. All the Indian families had totem poles and kept them set up before the doors of their houses. The idea of a totem pole is something like a door plate or a visiting card. It represents in its carvings the deeds and qualities of the family to which it belongs. This one, beautifully decorated and much higher than any other, was the Doolittle or, as it was to be henceforth called, the royal Thinkalot totem. It had nothing but animals on it, to signify the doctor's great knowledge of creatures, and the animals chosen to be shown were those which too, the Indians were supposed to represent good qualities of character, such as the deer for speed, the ox for perseverance, the fish for discretion, and so on. But at the top of the totem is always placed the sign or animal by which the family is most proud to be known. This, on the think a lot, pole, was an enormous parrot, in memory of the famous piece of the parrots. The ivory throne had been all polished with scented oil and it glistened whitely in the strong sunlight. At the foot of it there had been strewn great quantities of branches of flowering trees which with the new warmth of milder climates were now blossoming in the valleys of the island. Soon we saw the royal litter, with the doctor seated in it, slowly, ascending the winding steps of the table. Reaching the flat top at last, it halted and the doctor stepped out upon the flowery carpet. So still and Perfect was the silence that even at that distance above I distinctly heard. A twig snap beneath his tread. Walking to the throne accompanied by the old man, the doctor got up. Upon the stand and sat down. How tiny his little round figure looked. When seen from that tremendous height. The throne had been made for. Longer legged kings and when he was seated, his feet did not reach the ground but dangled six inches from the top step. Then the old man turned round and looking up at the people began to speak in a quiet even voice. But every word he said was easily heard in the furthest corner of the whispering rocks. First he recited the names of all the great popsipetal kings who in days long ago had been crowned in this ivory chair. He spoke of the greatness of the popsipetal people, of their triumphs, of their hardships. Then, waving his hand towards the doctor he began recounting the things which this king-to-be had done and I am bound to say that they easily outmatched the deeds of those who had gone before him. 
as soon as he started to speak of what the doctor had achieved for the tribe, the people, still strictly silent, all began waving their right hands towards the throne. This gave to the vast theater a very singular appearance. Acres and acres of something moving, with never a sound. At last the old man finished his speech and stepping up to the chair, very respectfully removed the doctor's battered high hat. He was about to put it upon the ground, but the doctor took it from him hastily and kept it on his lap. Then taking up the sacred crown he placed it upon John Doolittle's head. It did not fit very well, for it had been made for smaller-headed kings. And when the wind blew in freshly from the sunlit sea the doctor had some difficulty in keeping it on. But it looked very splendid. Turning once more to the people, the old man said, Men of Popsipetel, behold your elected king, are you content? And then at last the voice of the people broke loose. Zhang, Zhang, they shouted, Long live King Zhang. The sound burst upon the solemn silence with the crash of a hundred. Cannon, there, where even a whisper carried miles, the shock of it was. Like a blow in the face. Back and forth the mountains threw it to one, another. I thought the echoes of it would never die away as it passed. Rumbling through the whole island, jangling among the lower valleys, booming in the distant sea caves. Suddenly I saw the old man point upward to the highest mountain in the island, and looking over my shoulder, I was just in time to see the hanging stone topple slowly out of sight down into the heart of the volcano. See ye, men of the moving land, the old man cried, the stone has fallen and our legend has come true. The king of kings is crowned this day. The doctor too had seen the stone fall and he was now standing up, looking at the sea expectantly. He's thinking of the air chamber said Bumpo in my ear. Let us hope that the sea isn't very deep in these parts. After a full minute, so long did it take the stone to fall that depth, we heard a muffled, distant, crunching thud, and then immediately after, a great hissing of escaping air. The doctor, his face tense with anxiety, sat down in the throne again still watching the blue water of the ocean with staring eyes. Soon we felt the island slowly sinking beneath us. We saw the sea creep inland over the beaches as the shores went down. One foot, three feet, ten feet, twenty, fifty, a hundred. And then, thank goodness, gently as a Butterfly alighting on a rose, it stopped. Spider Monkey Island had come to rest on the sandy bottom of the Atlantic, and Earth was joined to Earth. Once more, of course, many of the houses near the shores were now underwater. Popsipetel Village itself had entirely disappeared. But it didn't matter, no one was drowned for every soul in the island was high up in the hills watching the coronation of King Jong. The Indians themselves did not realize at the time what was taking place, though of course they had felt the land sinking beneath them. The doctor told us afterwards that it must have been the shock of that tremendous shout coming from a million throats at once, which had toppled the hanging stone off its perch. But in Popsipetel history the story was handed down, and it is firmly believed to this day that when 
King Zhang sat upon the throne. So great was his mighty weight, that the very island itself sank down to do him honor and never moved again. Zhang Thinkalot had not ruled over his new kingdom for more than a couple of days before my notions about kings and the kind of lives they led changed very considerably. I had thought that all that kings had to do was to sit on a throne and have people bow down before them. Several times a day, I now saw that a king can be the hardest working man in the world if he attends properly to his business. From the moment that he got up, early in the morning, till the time he went to bed, late at night, seven days in the week, John Doolittle was busy, busy, busy. First of all there was the new town to be built. The village of Popsipetal had disappeared. The city of New Popsipetal must be made. With great care a place was chosen for it, and a very beautiful position it was, at the mouth of a large river. The shores of the island at this point formed a lovely wide bay where canoes and ships too, if they should ever come, could lie peacefully at anchor without danger from storms. In building this town the doctor gave the Indians a lot of new ideas. He showed them what town sewers were, and how garbage should be collected each day and burnt. High up in the hills he made a large lake, by damming a stream. This was the water supply for the town. None of these things had the Indians ever seen, and many of the sicknesses which they had suffered from before were now entirely prevented by proper drainage and pure drinking water. Peoples who don't use fire do not of course have metals either, because without fire it is almost impossible to shape iron and steel. One of the first things that John Doolittle did was to search the mountains till he found iron and copper mines. Then he set to work to teach the Indians how these metals could be melted and made into knives and plows and water pipes and all manner of things. In his kingdom the doctor tried his hardest to do away with most of the old-fashioned pomp and grandeur of a royal court. As he said to Bumpo, and me, if he must be a king he meant to be a thoroughly democratic one, that is a king who is chummy and friendly with his subjects and doesn't put on airs. And when he drew up the plans for the city of New Popsipetal he had no palace shown of any kind. A little cottage in a back street was all that he had provided for himself. But this the Indians would not permit on any account. They had been used to having their kings rule in a truly grand and kingly manner, and they insisted that he have built for himself the most magnificent palace ever seen. In all else they let him have his own way absolutely, but they wouldn't allow him to wriggle out of any of the ceremony or show that goes with being a king. A thousand servants he had to keep in his palace, night and day, to wait on him. The royal canoe had to be kept up, a gorgeous, polished mahogany boat, seventy feet long, inlaid with mother o' pearl and paddled by the hundred strongest men in the island. The palace gardens covered a square mile and employed a hundred and sixty gardeners. Even in his dress the poor man was compelled always to be grand and elegant and uncomfortable. The beloved and battered high hat was put away in a closet and only looked at secretly. State robes had to be worn on all occasions, 
and when the doctor did once in a while manage to sneak off for a short, natural history expedition he never dared to wear his old clothes, but had to chase his butterflies with a crown upon his head and a scarlet cloak flying behind him in the wind. There was no end to the kinds of duties the doctor had to perform and the questions he had to decide upon. Everything, from settling disputes about lands and boundaries, to making peace between husband and wife who had been throwing shoes at one another. In the east wing of the royal palace was the Hall of Justice. And here King Zhang sat every morning from nine to eleven passing judgment on all cases that were brought before him. Then in the afternoon he taught school. The sort of things he taught were not always those you find in ordinary schools. Dot, grown-ups as well, as children came to learn. You see, these Indians were ignorant of many of the things that quite small white children know. Though it is also true that they knew a lot that white grown-ups never dreamed of. Bumpo and I helped with the teaching as far as we could, simple arithmetic, and easy things like that. But the classes in astronomy, farming science, the proper care of babies, with a host of other subjects. The doctor had to teach himself. The Indians were tremendously keen about the schooling and they came in droves and crowds. So that even with the open-air classes, a schoolhouse was impossible, of course, the doctor had to take them in relays and batches of five or six thousand at a time and used a big megaphone or trumpet to make himself heard. The rest of his day was more than filled with road-making, building, water mills, attending the sick and a million other things. In spite of his being so unwilling to become a king, John Doolittle made a very good one. Once he got started, he may not have been as dignified as many kings in history who were always running off to war and getting themselves into romantic situations. But since I have grown up and seen something of foreign lands and governments I have often thought that Popsipetel under the reign of Zhang Thinkalot was perhaps the best ruled state in the history of the world. The doctor's birthday came round after we had been on the island six months and a half. The people made a great public holiday of it and there was much feasting, dancing, fireworks, speech making and jollification. Towards the close of the day the chief men of the two tribes formed a procession and passed through the streets of the town, carrying a very gorgeously painted tablet of ebony wood, ten feet high. This was a picture history, such as they preserved for each of the ancient kings of Popsipetel to record their deeds. With great and solemn ceremony it was set up over the door of the new palace, and everybody then clustered round to look at it. It had six pictures on it commemorating the six great events in the life of King. Zhang and beneath were written the verses that explained them. They were composed by the court poet, and this is a translation. His landing on the island, heaven sent, in his dolphin-drawn canoe. From worlds unknown he landed on our shores. The very palms bowed, down their heads in welcome to the coming king. 2. His meeting with the beetle, by moonlight in the mountains he. Communed with beasts. The shy Jabizri brings him picture words of. Great distress. He liberates the lost families, big was his heart with pity, big were his 
hands with strength. See how he tears the mountain like a yam. See how the lost ones dance forth to greet the day. 3. He makes fire, our land was cold and dying. He waved his hand and, lo, lightning leapt from cloudless skies. The sun leant down, and fire was born. Then while we crowded round the grateful glow, pushed he, our wayward, floating land back to peaceful anchorage in sunny seas. 4. He leads the people to victory in war, once only was his kindly countenance darkened by a deadly frown. Woe to the wicked enemy that dares attack the tribe with Thinkalot for chief. 5. He is crowned king, the birds of the air rejoiced, the sea laughed and gambled with her shores. All red skins wept for joy the day we crowned him king. He is the builder, the healer, the teacher and the prince. He is the greatest of them all. May he live a thousand thousand years, happy in his heart, to bless our land with peace.